Amen. Welcome again to all of you. Welcome to all of you groups. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us this morning. This week has been an emotional one for many of us here, individually and as a church body. We've had the highs of Winston coming home and us being able to celebrate his healing and his opportunity to continue in this road called life. And we've mourned with our pastor and his family. Some of us have been shocked by the death of Pastor Dean. It's been, a, it's been, it's been a, a road. It's been a lot of ups and downs. But isn't that like life? It's full of ups and downs. And what happens is in the midst of that at times, we often struggle in certain areas of our Christian walk. We often struggle with questions like if, why, if Winston was healed, why weren't the others? Or even questions like, why did they even have to be sick in the first place? And questions like that often cause us to struggle. And sometimes, unfortunately, we struggle in silence. Because as Christians, we are often ashamed of the struggle. We believe that we, when we get saved, sometimes our humanity goes out the door and we, we shouldn't feel anymore. We shouldn't have emotions anymore. And, and one of the struggles that we often have in times like these, in particular situations like these, is struggle with faithfulness. Either we struggle to believe that God is indeed faithful, like the way he says he is, because we see these things that seem to not match up with the character of a good and loving God, or we struggle with our own faithfulness towards God. You know, our intentions are good. Our heart is that we want to do good. We want to believe the right things. We want to say the right things. We want to be in the right place with God. But oftentimes we fall short. And we struggle. But despite what we see and we feel, we know that God is truth and so is his word. Here's what it says in Lamentations 3 then. Lamentations 3, chapter, um, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. It says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So despite what we see, despite what we may feel, the truth of the matter is, according to God himself, one who cannot lie, he is faithful. The book of Lamentations is a book with five separate poems in it, and these poems are expressing the humiliation and the suffering, also the despair that Jerusalem and its people are feeling following the destruction of the city from Babylon. They are in a bad place. They are in a bad way. And the author, Jeremiah, he expresses this grief on, for, that comes from himself, the grief that he himself is feeling, but also grief on behalf of his people and his home because God has pronounced judgment on them, primarily because of their pagan worship, primarily because they decided that they would go their own way and turn their back on God and do their own thing. And just as God had said what happened, if they did that, it happened. Babylon came in and destroyed everything. So he, he expresses his grief. He expresses his, 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 his anguish. But not only does he express this grief and this anguish, he also expresses his faithful commitment toward God. He acknowledges what he's going through hurts. He acknowledges the fact that he would prefer not to go through it, that he would prefer that his people not have to suffer the way they do. But in the midst of that, he acknowledges a bigger fact, the fact that God is faithful. But here's the thing, it's difficult, it's hard. It's difficult to be faithful when conditions aren't favorable. We can have all the best intentions in the world, but when life hits us in the gut, especially unexpectedly, it is difficult to remain faithful. And boy, does Jeremiah know it. Jeremiah is a prophet of God, one who, who God sees as righteous, one who serves him, one who loves God, yet he is suffering and so are his people. They're not getting enough food to eat. They are in bondage and oppressed. Their family members are dying and they feel like their God has forsaken them. And if you think long enough, you will find times in your life when you can relate to that feeling. You can relate to that situation. You too can relate to that reality. Most of us, if we are honest, there are times in our lives when we have lost our faith. 
Or if we have not completely lost it, we've been in seasons where we don't believe like we once did before. We weren't as faithful as we should have been. We weren't as faithful as we once were because it is hard to be faithful when conditions aren't favorable. It's difficult to be a faithful husband or wife when your spouse is mean and unloving and abusive. It's hard. <laughs> it's difficult to be faithful as an employee when your job is a dead end one and the pay is horrible and the people are snake. It's difficult. It's difficult to be a faithful church member when the church isn't living up to God's standards or isn't, isn't completing or carrying out rather God's mission. But difficult is not impossible. Difficult has never been an excuse for disobedience, like being disobedient to the call to faithfulness. I want to talk to you this morning about the call to faithfulness. Why do we have such a trouble with this call, especially in the times of trouble, especially in the times of trial? And I think one of the reasons, if not the main reason, it could be the curse of our culture. What do I mean by the curse of our culture? You see, in the West, we have a comfort-driven culture. We choose our homes based on which one is most comfortable. We want to live in the most comfortable type of home, in the most comfortable area. Nothing wrong with that within itself, but that is the driving factor. We want to drive the most comfortable car we could afford. So we don't want to drive the pasta. We want to upgrade to the note. We want comfort. We want, we want plush. We want to work at the most comfortable job possible. And for a lot of us, comfortable means get to go to work, pay, get paid, and do nothing. We want that. We want to go to the most comfortable church that has the most comfortable seats and the AC call that has the best sounding music and a really good preacher. We want comfort. We even want comfort in our relationships. That's why the internet is so full with all of these memes about how you should cut people off. You know, if they toxic, cut them off. If they don't feed you, cut them off. If, if, if you don't like them, cut them off. If they look a certain way, cut them off. If they alive, cut them off. Just cut them off, cut them off, cut them off. We even prefer to eat comfort food. We even want our food comfortable. Could it be that we have ignored the call to faithfulness in exchange for a culture of comfort? Now, we've been talking, saying we want revival at E.T. We even got the big sign behind me. That thing is huge. And E.T. wants revival, but this, to ignore the call to comfort, to, to faithfulness, will not work if you want revival. And if E.T. wants revival, then that can't work in E.T. Here's the thing. The call to faithfulness has two parts. And those are the two parts that I want to talk to you about this morning. And the first part of this call to faithfulness that God is calling us to individually and as a church is God's example to us. The text says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. And so this means then that God's faithful love, or depending on your translation, God's mercies is effective to save anyone. It says, because of his faithful love, we do not perish. Perish. His faithful love saves anyone, everyone, even people who are simply victims of being in a world that has sin in it. In other words, the things that you are going through, the trials, the hurt, the pain, are not your fault. They're not as a result of anything that you have necessarily done. It's simply as, as a result of, of the reality that we live in a world that's infected by sin. Ever since Adam, straight up to today. You see, Jeremiah, like I said, was a righteous man who served God, but he suffered along with the rest of his people when that time came when the time of suffering came he suffered as well despite the fact that he was good despite the fact that he didn't do anything wrong the psalmist says it like this in psalm 34 and 19 many are the afflictions many are the hard times many are the miseries of the righteous and that's the reality of living in a sin-laden world the, the, the innocent suffer and the wicked suffer. So the difference, though, between the innocent and the wicked is this. For the righteous, it goes on to say, but the Lord rescues him from them all. And so even though you may be righteous, you still have to feel the effects of living in a world that's affected by sin. But also know that the Lord has promised to deliver you from any and every affliction that you may face. Now, righteousness. Righteousness means 
basically in, in here to do right. But it does not mean that everything will go right. So in other words, you can still be affected by sin even if you aren't the one sinning. A couple of years ago, I went on a trip to Florida, exotic place, you know, almost like Europe. <laughs> and me and my family, we went to this theme park. Now, it's one of those theme parks that has the roller coasters and, and all of that stuff in it, but it also has a water section, the water park section. I, and I wasn't really interested in going to the water park section for two reasons. Firstly, my sons were very young then, and I really didn't want to have to look out for kids who, who, who may drown. And then the second reason is I had already showered that morning. And for me, that was enough water for the day. That was, I had reached my water plateau. <laughs> and so we are walking through the park. And I'm not interested in being wet, but, but I didn't realize that I had gotten very close to the roller coaster, you know, the ones that come down and splashes you to the water? I was really close. I didn't realize how close I was. And when the roller coaster came down, the water splashed up, and it totally soaked me. <laughs> totally. Shower number two. But it wasn't my fault. I wasn't on the ride. I simply felt the effects of being in a place where the thing I didn't want was there anyway. And this is Jeremiah's situation. And sometimes this is ours. But even in the midst of that, God is still faithful. This is, the, this is what Jeremiah is trying to get across to us. Now remember, Jeremiah is trying to help his people in the midst of this. He's trying to warn them of what God is saying and what they could do to prevent what is happening, what they could do to turn around the things that are happening to them. Jeremiah 2, 7 and 27 says, When you speak all these things to them, though, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer you. They mistreated Jeremiah. They beat him up, put him in shackles, tried to kill him. They burn up his homework. They call him a liar. He was suffering from hunger, he suffered thirst, he lost people he loved, he was thrown in jail. But in the midst of this, in the midst of all of this, God didn't take him out of it, but God kept him in the midst of it. And so when we go through this, the question then becomes, how do we respond? How should we, as believers, respond to this reality? In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul tries to help us figure out what it is we should do, the perception that we should have, the outlook we should have as we go through these sort of things. He says this, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we, as the people of God, are not destroyed. And this is the outlook you need to have as you go through. Yes, I've been hit. Yes, I've been knocked down. Yes, they've tried to take me out. Yes, life has been crushing me, but I am still here because of God. You see, we often have the wrong perspective. We think that just because we're drinking our water, we're eating right, plenty of asparagus, extra kale, and a little bit of quinoa. I don't even know what that is. Is that even real food? <laughs> and we're reading our Bible and praying every day. We believe nothing bad is supposed to happen to us. And so when bad things happen to us, we often think God is unfair. And the Apostle Paul, though, realized that God didn't have to show him mercy. See, that's the perception that we need to have. That's the outlook that we need to have. God doesn't have to show us mercy. The reality is God could have let those things destroy us. He could have. But because he has faithful love, because he is faithful love, this steps in, the character of God steps in now and holds us up and carries us through these times. He says, I could have been destroyed. I should have been destroyed. When my life didn't go the way I planned it, I would have been destroyed had it not been for the love of God. I could have been destroyed when I lost my job. I should have been destroyed when my loved one died. I would have been destroyed if I allowed life to get the best of me instead of looking to God who is my help. It is in times like these when life and all the crossfires of life come at us and all the foolishness that around us comes at us, that God puts up the mercy shield for us. It is times like this when Satan approaches God and asks, can we take them out? Is this, when, this is when God steps in and says, yes, you can take her stuff. Yes, you can take his health. But what you are not going to do is take their life. 
That's what mercy says. That's what mercy does. And here's the thing. Even if they do die for the believer, they go straight into the presence of the one who is faithful. So I want you to hear me today. For every believer in the room, it doesn't matter what happens to you in life, even death, because of God's faithfulness, you cannot lose. His faithfulness saves those who are affected by sin in the world, even if it isn't their fault. But it also saves people who bring things on themselves. See, some of y'all couldn't shout on the last point because y'all ain't innocent. Babylon came into Judah and did their thing, but that wasn't bad luck. It wasn't wrong place, wrong time. It was God pronouncing his judgment. And like I said, some of y'all couldn't shout on the last point because y'all going through stuff that y'all cause on yourself. What you're going through is a direct result of the bad choices that you have made. Just like Judah, just like Jerusalem. If you curse out your boss, you could get fired. That ain't the devil, that's you. <laughs> this is Judah's situation. They are in a situation of their own making. Jeremiah 25, 8 to 9, and now the Lord of heaven's army says, because you have not listened to me, I will gather together all the armies of the north under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whom, have I, whom I have appointed as my deputy. I will bring them all against this land and its people and against the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy you and make you an object of horror and contempt and ruin forever. This was the consequences of their sin. It was because they wanted to do things their own way. They wanted to do life without God. And we see how dangerous this is. We see how dangerous this way of thinking is when we look in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right. There is a way that feels right. In the modern culture of living life how we feel based on our feelings, emotions, and the fad of the day, this is what Proverbs warns us of. Many times when I talk to people or counsel with people who have situations going on in their life, and I ask, why do you do this? Why do you live that way? Often what comes out of their mouth, well, I did this because I felt. I do this because I feel. There is a way that seems, slash, feels right to a person. It does feel right to you. But the Bible tells you not to lean on your own understanding. When it said that, it meant that. Why? Because its end is the way to death. Yes, you have feelings. Yes, they are real. But your feelings are not truth. God and his word are. And so there's a way that seems right, but there's a way that is right. One leads to death and one leads to life. But what the good news is, in the midst of all of that, God is still merciful. And here's what happens sometimes. Because we go our own way, because we do our own thing, and we are not immediately consumed by God, God doesn't send fire down from heaven. He doesn't hit us down with the light limb bolt. He doesn't open up the earth and cause us to fall in. We get in our heads that God is in favor of what we are doing. We think that God's lack of wrath in that moment is a sign of God's favor. It's not. It's a sign of God's mercy. It's not that God thinks that what you're doing is right. Is that God wants to give you an opportunity to get it right. Because his mercy never ends. That's what the text says. It says, for his mercy never ends. It never ends. God's mercy is so powerful that it can endure the test of rebellion. Not just rebellion, it can endure the test of repeated rebellion. This same people who are going through this time, this time of, of, of tragedy and pain, they have a reputation of being rebellious against God. Sort of like me and you. Constantly doing things that are against the word and the heart of God. In Exodus 14, we see their lack of faith before they go to cross the Red Sea. In Exodus 15, we see them complaining over the bitter water. In Exodus 16, we see them complaining uh, uh, in the desert again just over their conditions. In Exodus 16, we see them collecting manna on days that they were not supposed to, being rebellious to God. 
In Exodus 17, again, they're complaining over a lack of water. In Numbers 11, complaining over a lack of food. In Numbers 14, failing to trust God on his promise that they would enter the promised land. What's amazing to me, which I cannot understand, is why through all of this, God still stayed with them. Even in their rebellion, he was there, not as a presence uh, to, 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 to comfort them in their sin, but as a presence to draw them back to him. He never left them. Why is that? Because it's the nature of God. He is merciful not just merciful but his mercies never end and we are rebellious just like they are and God is merciful to us just like he was to them even though you keep committing that sin you know the one that you've already done 20 times and you keep going back to ask for forgiveness for that same sin you know that one the one that you wait for everybody in the house to go sleep to do the one that have you up all night on the internet the, one, the reason you keep your phone locked and your browser history clean. Don't look at the person next to you. I'm talking to you. It's a wonder that God doesn't kill us where we are. It's a wonder that God doesn't destroy us the first time we mess up. But instead of doing that, he gives us a second chance and a third chance. And a fourth chance and a fifth chance. I'm on chance 597. And by the end of the day tomorrow, I'll be in the low 600s. But it's good. It's beautiful. And I'm grateful that God's mercies never end. So he has enough mercy to deal with my rebellion and my stupidity. And yours too. His mercy endures the test, not only of repeated rebellion, but also what I call extreme rebellion. You see, Moses goes up to the top of the mountain so he can meet with God to get some instructions for the people. And people being people did what people do. And so they decided, we're going to build a God that we can worship. We're going to melt our gold and build a calf, and then we're going to serve and worship that. We are going to make something with our own hands and then worship it as our God. Yeah, just meditate on that for a second. Let's think about that. And of course, Moses doesn't know what's going on. He's having a jolly time in the presence of the Lord. And here's what the Lord says, Exodus 37, 32, sorry, 7 to 10. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt are freaking themselves out. That's the MKV, the modern Kino version. You pick one up in the bookstore before you leave. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. Wow. They are saying, these are, our, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation." As if worshiping the calf that they made with their own hands wasn't bad enough, these people go a step further, extreme rebellion, and give credit to the calf, to the things that God had done for them. It says, this is your God, O Israel, the one that brought you out of captivity. Can you imagine that? Not only are they participating in the worship of an inanimate object, but they give it the credit that only God is due because they, they, they give it credit for something that only God had done. Done. The same way we do. Do we see ourselves in here? Do we see ourselves in Israel and their behavior and their attitude? Do you see it? If you don't, allow me to help you. Do you remember when you were lonely? Especially during COVID. And, and, and God gave you a relationship and now your spouse is your world and not God. I, I live for my husband. Better don't live for me. I live for my children. Do you remember when you were broke and God gave you a job and now your job is your provider and not him? Do you remember when you wanted to better yourself and, and God gave you opportunities to go to school and get credentials so you could move up, so you could get promoted and all these things, and now you find your identity in your degrees and your titles instead of in Christ? See, that's the same thing. That's the same heart. That comes from the same place as these people building this calf and then worshiping it and then saying, this is my God. This is our God. 
So we've got to be careful before we turn our nose up so quickly because the reality is, in a lot of ways and a lot of times, we are just like them. But God. It says, his mercies are new every day. Every morning, some translations say. It says, great is your faithfulness. This picture of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness is the perfect illustration of how life can be. It's not in their perfection that God shows mercy. That's how great it is. You don't have to get it all right to earn God's mercy. You don't have to be perfect to experience the mercy of God. It was in the middle of their mess that God sent manna from heaven to provide for them. But he sent it with a condition. But these people, they are just so stiff-necked. He said, what I want you to do is only take what you need for today. He says, don't store any up. Why? Because I promise to you through my faithfulness that tomorrow I will give you what you need for tomorrow. But see, they didn't trust God. And so what did they do? They did store up the manna because they did not trust that God would be faithful tomorrow as he was today. But we don't have that kind of God. We have a God that we can lean on, that we can trust, that we can rely on, who will bring us fresh manna every day single day. It says his mercies are new every morning. What that tells me is that his mercy or his manna cannot go stale. It's not a stale mercy. And that's, and, and that's good because if you ever eat stale cereal, you know it's not an enjoyable experience. Cereal should be crunchy. It should not stick to your teeth when you chew it. But God mercy doesn't stick to our teeth. It's fresh and it's crunchy every single day. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. I thank God that his mercy is new every morning. That is not used mercy because used stuff don't always work too good. Those of you that buy used cars, you know all too well. The things that can happen when you buy something used. But thankfully, his mercy is new every day. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, behold, I make all things new. I thank God that his mercy is new every morning. And so it's not a weak mercy because in my time of need, I need something that is bigger and stronger than me. And 1 Peter 5 and 11 says that all power belongs to God both now and and forever. Amen. This is the reality. This is the benefit of mercies that are new every day. And yes, yes, I get it. Yes, I agree. Every day does have a new set of problems. I walk the same life that you do. I live in the same country that you do, but also know that every day has a new set of mercies from God himself. He is faithful. And we cannot live a successful Christian life if we ever doubt that. We cannot live a successful Christian life if we begin to believe that he is lying about that. He is indeed faithful every day. And he renews his mercy and his faithful love every day. And so the first part of the call to faithfulness is God's example to us. He has showed us that he knows how to be faithful. Even, even when we fight him, even in our rebellion, even through our mistakes, he knows how to be faithful. In other words, he doesn't turn away from us when things don't look good. He knows how to draw us back when things aren't going right. He doesn't leave us to ourselves just because we can't seem to get it together. But there's also a second part. Not only, not only is there an example to us, but God has an expectation of us. If you flip over to Matthew chapter 25, beginning at about verse 14, there's a parable there. I think we call it the parable of the talents. And so there's a man, he goes on this journey and he talks to his servants before he leaves. And to the first servant, the Bible says that he gave five talents. And to the second one, he gave two. And to the third one, he gave one. And the scripture goes on to say to the one that he gave five talents to, he did what, what was needed. He worked the talents and he was able to get five more. And to the second, he worked the talents and he was able to get two more. And the last one, he dug a hole in the ground and put it there. And then when the master returns, he sees 
uh, what, what, what the first servant comes and brings to him, presents him five more than he had in the beginning. And the second one comes and he presents it to him and he gives him two more than he had to be, in the beginning. And here's what the master says to the servants in response to that. In verse 23, it says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Here we see Jesus through this parable equating fruitfulness with faithfulness. He says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Why was he faithful? Because he brought back five more than he had in the beginning. He produced. Why was the second one faithful? Because he brought back two more than he had in the beginning. He produced. They were able to double what was given to them. The evidence of their faithfulness was fruitful labor. Faithfulness is not a feeling, it's a function. It doesn't matter if you just feel faithful. Some of us in here do absolutely nothing for God in the kingdom, but we feel faithful. That should only hurt if it's true. We feel faithful. We feel all sorts of things. Feelings are not necessarily true. I grew up with a guy, he was extremely not well looking. But if you talk to him, you could tell in his mind, he felt like he was the most handsome dude on the planet. <laughs> he was convinced. He felt that way. The foundation of faithfulness is faith. It's in the word. Faithfulness, full of faith. And the Bible says, faith without works is dead. So how are you faithful but not fruitful? You aren't. That's how. It doesn't exist. Fruitfulness is the evidence of your faithfulness. Now, I want you to understand something here. Your fruitfulness comes not because you are so great, not because you are so awesome, not because you are so talented, but it comes, true fruitfulness, biblical fruitfulness comes from knowing the master. You see, the one who had the five talents and the one who had the two talents, they knew the master. That's why they did what they did, because they knew what he would expect. They knew what he required. They understood his heart and behaved in line with the desires of the master's heart. And they were able to please him upon his return. They knew him. Fruitfulness comes from a relationship with the master. The, the, the John says it like this in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning at verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you will dig a hole and put your talent in the ground. In other words, apart from me, you will, uh, cannot and will not do anything. To know the faithful one is to be like the faithful one. And this is where that expectation comes in. This is why God expects us to be faithful. One day I was sitting on the couch, chilling, just chilling, watching Netflix, eating ice cream. And I realized in that moment, because I had my legs crossed and I had, you know, my hand resting on my belly. That's when my belly was a little bigger. I get in back there, but I ain't there yet. And I realized that I was sitting just like my dad used to sit. And then this other time, I was watching a video that someone had taken of me, and I realized that I walked just like my dad used to walk. We had the same gait. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And one day after I had heard a joke and I was laughing, I was really laughing. If you ever see me laugh, I, I laugh like I mean it, you know. I laugh to the glory of God. You know, whatever you do, do with all your heart, you know. And I realized that I laugh like my father. Here's the thing. I wasn't trying to sit like him. I wasn't trying to walk like him. I wasn't trying to laugh like him. I wasn't trying to do any of those things like him. I wanted to be my own person. I wanted to be my own self. I wanted to do my own thing. But the reality is we had been so close for so long that even though I wasn't trying to, I began to behave like him without even trying. Do you know the master? Do you know your father? 
Can anyone tell by the way you sit? Can anyone tell by the way you laugh? Can anyone tell that you know him by the way you walk? Because the reality is faithfulness, when it comes to faithfulness, the proof is in the fruit. The proof is in the production. 1 John 2 and 6, the one who says he remains in me should, just, should walk just as he walked. Remains in him should walk just as he walked. If daddy is faithful and you know daddy, then you should be faithful. It should come naturally because you had been so close for so long that you began to pick up the behavior without even realizing it. So don't tell me that you know him. Don't tell me about your faithfulness and I can't see it. I can't see it in your walk. I can't hear it in your laugh. The proof is in the fruit. He says, you were faithful over a few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. In other words, he wants us to expect an increase. The Lord will promote those who produce. You were faithful over a little, I'm going to give you more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a little bit of stuff, that means I can trust you with more stuff. He was, they were faithful because they gave back more. They were faithful because they produced. They were faithful and so they were eligible for promotion. That's how promotion works in the kingdom. In the Bahamas, it's more like who you know. But in the kingdom, <laughs> promotion <laughs> works by fruitfulness, by production. They gave him back more than they had originally. So what I am saying is, if you want to get more than you have, then do more with what you have. Instead of just digging a hole and putting it in the ground, do more with what you have already. Don't just cry out every night, God, give me more, give me more, and you do nothing with what you have. Why should I give you more? For what? So you can continue to do nothing with more? Because if you do nothing with five bucks, you could do nothing with 50 bucks. It's not going to change who you are. The master gifted them with talents. It's not that the servant wasn't gifted. It's not the problem. The problem is the servant wasn't faithful. The bad servant, he buried it. He had it in his hand. And instead of doing something with it, instead of being faithful with it, the Bible says he buried it. The problem isn't that you don't have what you need. The problem is you don't use what you have. But you expect an increase. You expect it. When the others get it, you mad. Just like this. When the servant came, the servant with the one talent, when he came to the master, he came with an expectation to get what they got, which is crazy because he didn't do what they did. Where does your expectation come from? Where do you get this expectation of more from when you do nothing? Where does that come from? Let me tell you where it comes from. The Bible tells us in verse 26, his master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. You expect to get the same that others get who have actually put in the effort and put in the work. You expect that because you evil and you lazy. You want to put yours in the ground, bury it, do nothing, wait for the master to come back, and then hold your hand out and say, give me more. You evil and you lazy. That's what it says. You see, God wants to give you increase, but you have to show initiative. You got to do something. He says, come and share your master's joy. He wants wants us to enjoy our inheritance. This call to faithfulness, this expectation from us, yes, it's a heavy one, but at the end of it, there's a prize. At the end of it, there's a, it's, it's not for nothing. Those who are faithful with the master's gifts, they get to share in the master's joy. If you are faithful with the gifts, you get to share in the joy. And in this context, Jesus is talking about the ultimate joy of being with him for eternity. Yes, he is. But there is a sense in which this points to joy here on earth as well. Let me show you how. We are most happy, we as believers, as human beings actually, especially believers, but we as people are most happy when we make the master happy. That's when we are truly at our happiest 
All of these other temporal things are temporary happiness. We have true joy, true eternal joy, true eternal happiness when we make the master happy. How do we know that? Scripture tells us in Revelation 4 and 11 that we were created for God's pleasure. In other words, the purpose you exist is to make God pleased or happy. That's why you were created. You were created for him. And our faithfulness gives God pleasure, which causes us to fulfill the purpose for which we were made, which gives us pleasure. Anytime someone fulfills the purpose for which they are made or fulfills the purpose for which they are called to, they get pleasure. When, I, when, when, when I'm washing the car and my little son says he wants to help, and I tell him, okay, you could have, you wash that tire right there. I have given him purpose. And then when he is done, and I look at it, and it's still dirty, because, you know, he can't clean it properly. But I won't break his spirit. So I say, good job, buddy. He is happy. Why? Because he fulfilled the purpose that I had given him. That's where we find our true pleasure from. All of these other things, all of these temporal things, the things in life that do give us joy, but they fade away. All of these carnal and fleshly, all of these carnival and fleshly things that bring us joy <laughs> temporarily. In other words, he's saying, when you've been faithful, you can take joy in the fact that you have pleased God and let that joy be your strength. Let it be your strength. Let me tell you why you should let it be your strength. Because you're going to need it. Because if you're going to be faithful to God, then that means you're going to make enemies with the world. Faithfulness to God is going to cause you to make, at some point, if you're doing it right, you're going to make enemies with the world. Not everybody is going to understand you. And that could cause problems. That could cause us to feel some type of way. That could cause us to feel alone and ostracized. But that's okay if we have the joy of the Lord in us. Not everybody is going to be for you. Not everybody is going to be like you. And that's going to make us feel attacked and hurt. But that's okay if you have the joy of the Lord in you. Because at the end of the day, for us, especially Christians, the mission is to please God, not men. It doesn't matter if every man on the planet is against you if God is for you. And it doesn't matter if every man on the planet is for you if God is against you. Galatians 1 and 10 says, For am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. In other words, let me break it down for you. If God is happy, then so am I. So I'll be faithful. I'll be faithful so that I know God is happy and in turn I'll be happy. I've spoken to you as individuals this morning, and I hope you get it. I hope you get my point. My points are simple, that God is faithful no matter what, and he does have an expectation of us to be faithful no matter what. But along with the expectation, he will always give and always, he has proven that he will always give an empowerment along with the expectation. He doesn't expect you to do that on your own. As a matter of fact, to be faithful on your own as a human being is impossible. Not the kind of faithful that God is looking for. And so he empowers you to do what he asks of you. But the expectation remains. So when life comes and does what life does, be faithful. Don't let go. That's the time to cling tighter. That's the time to believe more. That's the time to strengthen your faith. That's what the call to faithfulness is. It's easy when things are good. I'm talking about when life gets hard, when it hits you in the gut, when you don't see it coming. God is saying, remain faithful, because when you hit me in the gut, I remain faithful to you. God is saying remain faithful because the other, the other choice is to go your own way and you know how that turns out ultimately. So be faithful. Be faithful because the reality is in the end, it's going to work out. It's not going to work itself out. That's a lie. God will work it out in the end if you remain faithful. Things don't work themselves out. What do you think this is? Disney World? God works things out. I've talked to you as individuals, but give me a minute before I take my seat to talk to you as a church. E.T., evangelistic temple, is God's idea. This church is God birthed, and it is God kept. And he, God, has allowed us to be around for 88 years. Now, I'm nowhere near 88 years old. Yes, I got 
I got some grades coming in, and I'm moving in that direction. And I, and I pray that, that I live to see that type of age. But I'm not there. But I, my, my, my maternal grandparents both lived into their early 90s. And here's what I learned from watching them. You don't get to be around for 88 years and not go through some stuff. You don't last 88 years and the enemy not try to take you out at least a time or two. You don't exist for 88 years and not make some mistakes along the way. You don't last 88 years without having days when you just want to quit. But here's what I also know. That you don't last 88 years apart from the faithfulness of God. You don't last 88 years without God making a way out of situations a time or two. You don't last 88 years without God pulling you out of a ditch or two. You don't last 88 years without experiencing the new mercies that he has promised every single day. And here we are, 88 years of God being faithful to us. And the question to me, the question in my mind and the, in my mind, and the question that I want to ask to you is what do we do now? And here's the answer. Answer the call. Answer the call to faithfulness. When God calls, don't just let it ring like we do with so many others. Pick it up. Answer it. When he messages, don't blue tick him. Respond to the call. The call to be faithful. God has placed us here, church, evangelistic temple in this country, specifically in this community for now, at this time, for a purpose, for a reason, it is not by accident. Here's the reality. We have feet, so we need to faithfully go to the people. We have hands, so we must faithfully serve the people. We have mouths, so we need to faithfully give the gospel to the people. So when he sends us resources, E.T., we have to faithfully steward them. When he sends us people, we must faithfully love them. When he sends us children, we must faithfully train them. When he sends us souls, we must faithfully point them to the one that can save them. The master gave one good servant two talents, and the servant gave the master two more. The master gave the other servant, good servant, five talents. And the servant gave him five more. The master has given you 88 years. An evangelistic temple, if I have anything to do with it, we will give him 88 years more. He is the ultimate example of faithfulness. And he has an expectation of faithfulness from us. And so what I'm saying to you is simple. Answer the call to faithfulness. Here's what God says to us. He is the ultimate example and so he has an expectation. He says it may not always look favorable but I have always been faithful. As my children be faithful. Don't give up. As my children be faithful. Don't let go. As my children be faithful. Don't you dare give in. Be faithful. He gave us the example. Let's live up to the expectation and watch God work. He has promised and he will not fail. The question is, what will we do? How will we respond? Are we going to continue the way that we've always gone? Experience the results that we always get and then continue to blame God for that? Or will we hear the voice of God today? Will we respond to the Spirit of God today, pricking at our hearts, saying, you're not where you used to be. You don't believe the way you used to. You don't look to me anymore in your time of trouble. You don't trust me the way you used to. You put your trust in horses, and you put your trust in chariots, but me... Even if I'm by myself, I will put my trust, my faith in the name of the living God. Because at the end of the day, there's coming a time when God will separate the sheep from the goat. And that which separates the sheep from the goat is him saying to the sheep, well done, my good and faithful servant. So what are you going to do? Because he goes on to explain why they were faithful. When I was hungry, you fed me. 
in the midst of all that was going on, in the midst of the tragedy and trials in your life, you fed me. When I was thirsty, even though you were thirsty too, you gave me something to drink. And when I was in prison, but you felt like you were in hell, you still came to visit me. There's no revival without faithfulness. What are you going to do? The phone is ringing. Are you going to answer it or not? I hate preaching messages like this. Because as Pastor Cash said the other day, they wreck me before I have to come to you. They break me down before I have to come to you. And I had to repent just like many of you in here now have to repent. Because we aren't where we once were. We aren't, more importantly, where we should be. And so before we close, because I'm already over time, so...